Enlightenment happened in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, we are immensely affected by that in everything from what you teach in Year 7 Science to the scientific method through to the one of the hymns we sang this morning over at the West written by Isaac Watts who was at the centre of the development of steam and physics and how we move. The Enlightenment was a significant moment because humans worked out they could use this thing to explain the world. And they were able to explain the world rationally and with great reason. And for many, that shone light on the universe. For many, that meant that humans were going to inevitably progress and go forwards. For many, it meant that humans and their abilities were at the centre of the universe and progress would never end. Now, if you think about that, you'll see that the Enlightenment offers what every search wants. Who's at the centre of the universe? I'm at the centre of the Well, not me, but all of us are at the centre of the universe, aren't we? And by our ability, we can turn creation to our own ends and desires. And because we're all born basically good, that will always lead to progress, won't it? I was sitting with a couple preparing for a funeral last year and they said to me that they'd never thought about the purpose of life. So as they came to bury one of their children, they found something missing. As I look out over world politics, as I look out over global conflict, as I face an election year, I don't think I'm faced by a world bathed in light, am I? I think I'm actually faced by a world shrouded in darkness where the search for enlightenment has only just placed me at the centre of the universe and shed no light on anything. I think that's largely because we've actually forgotten the moment the real enlightenment happened. It didn't happen in a laboratory, did it? It didn't happen when we sat and thought and realised I am. It actually happened when a bloke moved house in the Middle East hundreds of years ago. And we're going to look at that today. Let's pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. Thanks that we can sit here and read it. Please apply it to our hearts and minds. Please transform our lives. And please send us out to declare it to a world shrouded in darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God's people, the Jews, perched in that little strip on the Mediterranean, remember Newcastle to Wollongong out to the Blue Mountains? Perched there, they're, they're not doing real well, are they? Uh, they're in their own territory, but they're dispossessed and they're disappointed. Uh, if you think of the pantry, the promises that created them as the people of God are way up the back and have a use-by date on them that is many years before. Those promises were very clear. The promise made to Abraham that out of Abraham's family, a broken world would be blessed. Out of a family connected with David, that there would be a king to rule the universe in justice and peace and rightly. And when those two promises come together in one man, that there will be a saviour for the whole world. Now there as the people see it and as they think about those promises, like I said, they're at the back of the pantry and the use by date seems to have gone. They're dusty and they're broken. And Matthew writes this biography, if you remember, to say to people, hey, let me introduce you to Jesus because he is the bloke who will do everything God has promised. Look at his family tree. Uh, He's been announced, revealed and tested. That's what we looked at last week, wasn't it? He's the only bloke who's able to look the devil in the eye and tell him to go away. But I want to know, what does this bloke bring to the table? I mean, that's how we're going to think this year with the election, aren't we? What does this bloke bring to the table? What's his method? What's his policy? How will he change the world? Well, listen to what happens when he starts his public ministry. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. Oh, it's pretty anticlimactic, isn't it? Saviour of the world moves house. It's not really what I expect of a saviour, is it? A moving house? I've done that and look at me. The saviour of the world moving house. Now the time's unclear. We know it's at least 40 days and 40 nights after the, the period when Jesus was baptised, but we don't know the time frame. Oh, we do know a couple of things, don't we? We know that John 
has gotten offside with local political authorities. Not a wise move when you tell a dictator he's in an almost incestuous relationship and so he's promptly put in jail, isn't he? And we know that when, and this is clear, that when John is put in jail, the age of the prophets has finished. You know, John was the last, wasn't he? Uh, the prophets are men and women sent by God to proclaim God's message to God's people and everything they're on about, these wild and woolly men and women, everything they're on about is, is here. And then Jesus moves house. It's a bizarre move for the saviour of the universe, isn't it? I, I can understand it and you'll see the, the maps come up here on the slide. I understand some of the reasons. I mean, he wants to move to safety and the further you move from the capital, the better you are. It's the way it works in the diocese, the further west you go. No, I didn't say that. Uh, But you know how it works, doesn't it? If I move further from the capital, the spies aren't there and so I'm safer. The problem is the spies are everywhere if you're Herod. Now, Galilee, I can understand that. It's a fairly significant place on significant trading routes. It's an area that was densely populated. Josephus says the smallest town had 15,000 people in it. Uh, Even given for exaggeration, that's a densely populated area, isn't it? Uh, It's an area known for its agriculture. Every known patch of dirt was cultivated. It's an area where way back before the regional superpower had imported a whole lot of non-Jews. That area right up the top. Uh, It's a significant area, so if you're going to save the world, that's a good area to move to on the trade routes, isn't it? Uh, One other commentator said Judea is on the way to nowhere, Galilee is on the way to everywhere. Uh, Good political move, isn't it? Away from the capital into a densely populated cosmopolitan area where you know people are moving and people are open to new ideas. But Matthew doesn't leave us to question, does he? Did you notice that in verse 14? to fulfil what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Now, all those other reasons matter, but Matthew makes sure we have the reason for the move and that is because Jesus is a man who stays on message. He is a king who does not waver. He is a man who does not channel flick and he stays on what is important. He moves house based on God's plans. He moves house based on God's plans. Now, if you've been reading through Matthew, you'll notice that that's his method constantly, isn't it? This is the seventh time where Matthew has made that connection. It's not as if Jesus woke up one day and said, I'm sick of being a carpenter, I want to be a Messiah. No, right from the day he was born, Jesus is self-aware that he is fulfilling the purposeful promises and plans of God. Seven times Matthew says, look at the link. This happened because God said. This happened because God said. This happened because God said. Jesus stays on message. Now, one of the things you'll notice over the next 12 months is how annoying it is when politicians stay on message. That's what we're going to have, isn't it? Uh, you'll listen to so many interviews on the 7.30 report and no matter the question, the answer is always the same, isn't it? I, I want the answer. But that's the nature of a campaign. At, by 7am every morning of the campaign, the campaign team will send every member on the campaign trail a text or an email saying, this is the sentence for the day. By 7am your phone will be and you'll open your phone and you'll get, this is the message for the day. This is, what, this is what I'm on about. No matter the question, no matter the discussion, no matter the circumstance, this is what I'm on about. Jesus stays on message, doesn't he? Jesus stays on message. No other message than the faithful promise of God and the faithful method of God. The faithful promise that I'll save the world, the faithful method of God which I'll do through mercy. So how does he stay on message here? Well, I'm at point two on the outline because... Matthew makes the link, doesn't he? He says, why don't you go back and read about Isaiah? And that was the other reading we had from Isaiah chapter 8, wasn't it? A a reading that accounts for events that happened hundreds of years before. Isaiah is a prophet. A prophet, like I've said, is a man or woman who proclaims God's word to God's people. He's sent to confront God's people. Prophets tend to do that. 
He sent to a place called Judah. Now, let's just go back a little bit in our history. Uh, after Solomon, the third king, God's mob split into two parts, didn't they? Uh, down the south, you have two tribes around the capital, Jerusalem, and that's called Judah. That's the place where this line of David stays persistent. But even an art student can do the maths and 12 minus 2 equals 10, doesn't it? And so up the north, you've got 10 tribes. And they're called Israel and their capital is Samaria. They tend to do things without really talking to God or listening to God. They tend to do things their own way. Isaiah is sent down the south to confront Judah, their affluence, their abuse of power, their abuse of the poor, their exploitation of each other, the way that they'll offer sacrifices to God with the blood of innocence on their hands and reject the widow and the orphaned and the refugee. They're just stubborn unwillingness to listen to God. They just don't trust God to do as he promised. Now the region is just in turmoil. There's a regional superpower called Assyria and they're making moves all over the place and so alliances are being developed and the public opinion polls are speaking and Ahaz, if he was around today, would always listen to what the Sydney Morning Herald said. He just whims and whams and flips and flops and goes everywhere and he just doesn't trust God. And one day when he's out checking the town water supply for Jerusalem, Isaiah comes to him and says, Hey, Ahaz, trust God. Take him at his word. He will not let you down. If you don't trust God, things will go pear-shaped. What do you reckon Ahaz did? He opened up the pages of the Sydney Morning Herald and worked out the latest opinion poll and he made an alliance, didn't he? It wasn't all doom and gloom. God did say that if things went pear-shaped, God was in charge of that too. And out of that he would create a remnant, a small group, not a large group. And that little remnant would be connected to some figure called the suffering servant. And that little remnant and that suffering servant would do everything that God had promised. Just like God had said, take him at his word. Take him at his word. In fact, Ahaz was told, just look over the border and see what will happen to Israel. But he ignores God's word. He ignores God's very clear word. He makes an alliance with Egypt. He chooses Egypt over God. And listen to what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18, where Isaiah is speaking. Here am I, Isaiah, and the children, the little group the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. When men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, shouldn't a people inquire of their God? Why do you consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law, to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they'll roam throughout the land. When they're famished, they'll become enraged and looking upward, they'll curse their king and their God. Then they'll look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom and they'll be thrust into utter darkness. It is horrible, isn't it? I mean, humans hate the dark. That's why we've got night lights. We hate any darkness, but this darkness? You're surrounded by the menace of international politics. You've got the word of God clearly spoken to you. Isaiah and his family and a few others are the last faithful ones listening to God. What do the rest do? They go anywhere else but God. They take a seance over a sentence. They take a medium over the message of God. To put it bluntly, they'll talk to Casper the friendly ghost over Isaiah the prophet. And where does it go? God hides his face. God hides his word. And they will walk in darkness. They will curse the day they ignored God 
they will wander and wander and wander. It's pretty clear what the darkness is, isn't it? The darkness comes when the word of God is rejected. Why is that? Well, what happened in Genesis 1? The word of God, and what happens? There's life and light. What happens in Genesis 1 and 2? The word of God, and there's light and life, and it's ordered. What happens in Genesis 3? Well, the sin of Adam and Eve is exposed as the word of God comes out. In Genesis 6, God's word brings judgment on humans whose hearts always go away from God. In Genesis 12, God commits to a world that is broken of his own free will. That's what Psalm 19 is all about, isn't it? Did you notice that? Verses 1 to 6 are about the enlightenment because I can make creation say what it doesn't say. Verses 7 on are about the word of God which brings light and life. You see, wherever the word of God is rejected, you have the opposite, don't you? Not life but death, not light but darkness, not order but chaos, not judgment on sin but living in sin, not commitment to solving a broken world but loving living in the brokenness. And the pattern's the same right throughout the Bible, constantly the same. Reject the word of God and you will live in darkness. Did you notice those syllables at the start of Isaiah 9 verse 1 though? (laughs) Nevertheless, there will be a time when the light will come back and the shroud of darkness will be lifted and the silence of God will end and that light will be the word of God. Well, Ahaz looked over the border and in 722 it happened, didn't it? Assyria came down, swept away the north, came down like a flood around Jerusalem, like a noose around a neck. The north was taken away. Where did they go? Well, the Assyrians are smart. They took them out through those little territories up the north, Zebulun and Naphtali. The darkness of leaving that patch of dirt was matched by the darkness of not having the word of God. And so out of Zebulun and Naphtali they walked into exile because they had ignored the word of God. But a time would come. Nevertheless, who imagined that changing your postal address would bring light to the universe? That's really what happened, isn't it? That's really what happened when we're told in Matthew chapter 4, verse 14, that he moved house to fulfil what was said through the prophet. Uh, That's really what's going on there, isn't it? That as Jesus moves house, he moves to the area out of which God's people went in darkness in order to do what the nevertheless promised. And what's the first thing that Jesus does? Did you notice that? Verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, that's a little disappointing. Uh, let's be blunt. Moved house and spoke. Oh, we live in a culture that values action, don't we? We hate talk fests. We hate promises that are words, not backed up by deeds. And yet that's what Jesus does. He talks. Uh, profoundly disappointing. We hate talking. We hate preaching. Uh, I met a man this week who found out I was a minister and before I'd even said another thing, he said to me, don't you preach at me. No, that, that's our attitude, isn't it? We don't like words. We want action. But could Jesus have done anything else at this point? He couldn't, could he? You see, the darkness is there because God's word has been rejected and the light comes because God's word is spoken. That's who Jesus is, isn't it? Just remember that genealogy? Son of David and son of Abraham come to do everything that God's people hope for. The one who will be named Jesus, Matthew 1 verse 21, because he will deal with what? Sin. And he will deal with that by speaking the word of God. That's the point. That's the starting point. That's how the brokenness of the world will be dealt with 
as the word of God is spoken. Jesus speaks. His message is a message that confronts. Humans need to repent, don't they? We use that word often, don't we? Repent. I was sitting there at Baron Junction Scripture looking at a bunch of boys a couple of years ago and every explanation I had of repentance, just the eyes glazed over. I understand that. Those boys out there think either red or green. That's all they think. And they think about driving tractors, don't they? Well, that's repentance, isn't it? They all drive tractors at GPS steer assist. What happens is you get close to the end of the road. Beep, 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 put down the book, turn the DVD off, turn around. That's repentance, isn't it? There's a word of warning and you turn around. There's a word of warning and you turn around. Those boys got it. They repented at the end of every row. That's the message. Turn around. Listen. Hear. That's a message that reveals, doesn't it? You've got to deal with a new authority in the world. That's really the message, isn't it? That the kingdom of heaven is near. Think of those wild west towns and a new sheriff comes in. Whatever the people think, want or consider, you've got to deal with the fact there's a new sheriff, whoever he is. God's king is here. The man who looks the devil in the eye and tells him to go away. Whatever you think, you've got to deal with him. It's a message that reveals the reality of the human world. You see, if you follow it carefully, if the kingdom has come and if humans have to change, and all humans, notice it's Galilee of the Gentiles, everyone, and if humans have to change, that means that humans have been operating under another power, isn't it? A pretend power, a rival. The Bible has a word for that, doesn't it? It's the word sin. That little word with I in the middle captures the enlightenment. It's the attitude and action that says I am God and God is not. It rejects God's word. It chooses darkness over light. It chooses chaos over order. It chooses death over eternal existence in the presence of God and humans in sin have to work out what they're going to do with the fact that the king is here. Repent. Now, I don't know about you, but I suspect that that will be the most enlightening words you'll hear ever. It reveals the state of the world. It reveals the faithfulness of God. It reveals the nature of my heart. It exposes the pretend nature of everything I built. Oh, we could go on, couldn't we? You see, that's the enlightenment. When a man chose to move house on the banks of the Mediterranean. The search for enlightenment will always carry on, won't it? As long as we look for alternatives to God and Jesus. But really, the enlightenment crystallised what's at the heart of every search for enlightenment that I run, and that is I'm at the centre. Now, if I use the scientific method to analyse that, the evidence tells me something else, doesn't it? (laughs) Six billion gods running the world, it goes well, doesn't it? There's nothing enlightening about that. The real enlightenment didn't happen in a laboratory or with a method or a discovery of anything new. It took place when a bloke moved house and spoke. It took place when Jesus came and spoke a message that confronted, revealed and commanded. Now, please, don't be confused about his methods. He speaks. That's his method. He speaks and that's his method. We cannot stress too highly the importance of listening to what God says through Jesus. Please also don't be confused about the message he speaks. It's very simple and clear. God's king is here. Deal with it. Repent. Turn around. Understand. Now, if you have understood that message, please don't overcomplicate it. 
Don't manipulate it. Don't change it. Very simple. If you haven't heard that message, please hear it. Please listen to Jesus. And please hear the light that he brings because the alternative is to wander in darkness. And please, don't be confused about the extent of this message. Rich or poor, black or white, educated, uneducated, employed, unemployed, the free, the oppressed, people who have a lovely family history, people who have a terrible family history, people who are mourning, people who are in joy. It's a message for all people because it's the only one that's going to bring life. Let me pray. Dear God, we give you thanks for your word. Right throughout history, your word has brought light. Our abuse or ignorance of it has brought darkness. Father, today we've heard a message that brings light. It reveals our nature. It reveals your promise and method. And it shows us your king. Father, please bring light into our lives through this word. In Jesus' name, amen.